So welcome to uh, Design at Large. Um, this is our second talk of the quarter. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Danielle Bragg from the University of Washington. Uh, and uh, she works in this really, really interesting area. And it's, uh, it's an especially good time to be working in that area. I mean, she works in this area of sort of accessibility and HCI and machine learning. And uh, I am just, you know, amazed at how much computing power we have today. I mean, there's been, there's been a billion Google searches today. And every one of those searches took the equivalent computing power of all the computing that went on in the Apollo project to put a man on the moon. And, uh, and I think many of us can't really, I surely can't, fathom the possibilities. And, uh, and I think, you know, what people are designing are sort of the intellectual and social workplaces of the future. And those should be beautiful, wonderful places to be. And more and more of the computing power needs to go to supporting people in that. And accessibility is surely one of the really key aspects. I mean, uh, Danielle in her abstract talks about there being a billion people with disabilities. Uh, and I think that's an underestimate. I think that we all have all kinds of disabilities. And oftentimes when people focus on accessibility for one area, they end up building things that are better for all of us. And, uh, and I always try to find something out about the speaker that they don't know I know. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, you know, it was a little hard with you. You're, you're young. Uh, That's true. But I found out that she is a very accomplished musician and that she uh, has taken the bassoon, which I am told is the absolute hardest instrument <laughs> to learn to play. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, so I give you to Danielle and she's going to talk about accessible information systems. All right, thank you so much. That was one of the most amazing introductions I've ever heard. <laughs> um, not for myself, but just in general. Um, so my name is Danielle Bragg, and I am a PhD student in the Computer Science and Engineering Department at the University of Washington, finishing up my dissertation there. And today, I'm excited to talk to you about a bunch of work I've done that's going to be going into my dissertation on building accessible information systems. So worldwide, there are about 70 million deaf people using a sign language as their first language. Uh, sign languages are movement-based, they're not spoken, and they're not typically written. In the US alone, American Sign Language, which I'll abbreviate as ASL, is the primary language of about half a million people. Uh, hearing people also use sign languages. ASL has become the third most studied language in higher education behind only French and Spanish. Because ASL does not have a widely accepted written form, a lot of our text-based platforms don't fully support ASL users. Using English isn't a good solution all the time because it's a completely different language. That's like saying if there wasn't a written form of English, oh, that's okay, just use Chinese characters, and by the way, you'll never hear Chinese spoken. Worldwide, there are also about 300 million people with visual impairments, 246 million of whom have low vision. Now, low vision is defined as vision not near 2020 or quote unquote normal vision with best correction. So even if you're wearing glasses or contacts, you still don't see very well. And most people who use glasses do not actually have low vision. Uh, low vision impa impacts daily life, and in particular, it can make reading text difficult, especially on small screens. So the low vision community is also a group who, for whom text can be inaccessible. And despite this large group that might have trouble with text, uh, many of our daily communications and almost all of our online communications are text-based. We have informational resources like Wikipedia, we have search engines, where even if you're looking up something having to do with a sign language, you're forced to use a written language like English. We have email clients, 
We have social media, and we have online documents that support collaboration for content creation. And again, all of these are text-based resources that might not be accessible. So in this talk, I will present systems I've built to improve accessibility for sign language users and low vision readers who may encounter difficulties with text. And these systems de demonstrate three main points I'd like you to take home. So first, uh, modern technologies support new interactions that can address longstanding accessibility challenges. Uh, we've developed really powerful technical tools, as Jim mentioned, and really powerful interfaces. And applying these modern techniques to longstanding accessi accessibility problems can be really powerful. So second, this can require breaking with tradition, which personal devices allow. So today's personal devices allow us to tailor our displays to suit our own needs. So you can use a, an interface that no one else is using, which wasn't possible in the past. And finally, these systems can be designed in principled ways using data. And that might be data collected remotely at large, and it might be data collected from sitting down and talking to people. So the three systems I'll be presenting are, first, an ASL to English dictionary that enables people to look up signs and learns from its users to improve search results. Second, alternate English scripts that are designed to improve legibility for low vision readers. And third, an animated ASL character system uh, for reading and writing in ASL. So without more introduction, I'll dive into the first system, which is the ASL to English dictionary. So suppose you saw this sign. You might be in a lecture, you might be watching an online video, and you didn't know what it meant. How would you look it up? Does anyone have any ideas? OK, well, I'll, oh, sure. So I would try to describe the gesture and type it into Google. Yeah, so that's one technique that people use, either with a search engine like Google or, or with YouTube. Um, and I'll get to why that doesn't always work so well in a second. Uh, the most uh, long-standing method that we have are paper-based dictionaries. And here's an example of a page in such a dictionary. Uh, these dictionaries are typically organized by a particular feature in the language, for example, hand shape. So if you don't know the hand shape of the sign that you're looking up, uh, it's fairly hopeless. And even if you know the hand shape, you might have to leaf through many pages to find what you're looking for. It's what we used to have to do when we were looking up a word that we didn't know, and we didn't know how to spell it, perhaps. Uh, as Scott mentioned, we have search engines. You can try to use one of these to type in an English query describing the sign that you're trying to look up. Uh, but uh, these methods typically don't work very well because uh, indexing is, of videos is typically done on English words, and uh, that type of feature extraction uh, isn't able to, to accurately extract features quite yet. And describing movements in words is hard. You can also try to look up a sign by demonstrating it to various types of sensors. We have video cameras. We have 3D sensors like the Kinect. We have gloves that can pick up on movements, and so on. Uh, and in order for this to be successful, you have to re recreate the sign accurately, which can be difficult if you don't know the sign that you're trying to look up. And uh, the state of the art in sign language recognition and translation really isn't quite there yet. Uh, it's a really hard problem. So to try to address this problem, we designed a feature-based dictionary, which we call ASL Search, where a user inputs a set of features describing the sign that they're trying to look up. The dictionary returns a sorted list of signs that it thinks match that incoming query. And at the end, the user has the option to tell the dictionary which sign they were actually looking for so that the dictionary can learn from that user's experience. To give you an idea of what that looks like, here's our search interface with the drop-down for hand shape selection opened. The selected features are then translated into a vector of ones and zeros, where a one represents the presence, the selection of a particular feature, and a zero means that that feature was not selected. 
And this is fed into the back end of the dictionary, which consists of a sign by feature matrix that stores counts of features for each sign. So each row represents a sign. For example, one might represent the sign, thank you. Each column represents a feature, for example, the open B hand shape. And then the intersection of the row and column shows the percentage of queries for that sign that use that particular feature in the query. We use this matrix to match the incoming query to signs using latent semantic analysis, which is a top topic modeling procedure. Uh, basically, the incoming query and the matrix are both projected down into a lower dimensional space, and that helps remove noise and identify meaningful dimensions in this high dimensional feature space. And then in that lower dimensional space, we can compare the query against signs using cosine similarity. And as a result, we're able to return a list of signs sorted by similarity so that the most similar signs are at the top. Now, when we're first deploying this dictionary, we don't have any past user data to learn from, so the dictionary is not going to do well at all. And to handle this startup problem, we proposed a complementary system, which we call ASL Flash. Uh, this system shows the user a video and quizzes them on the meaning and feature. Uh, the user then provides the meaning and feature that they can identify in the video. And in return, they're given the sign definition so that they reinforce their vocabulary. To give you a feel for what this looks like, this might be the initial video that they're shown. They're then quizzed on the meaning in English. We then ask them to input descriptive features, and this is the data that's going to power our dictionary. And this is also a useful task for students um, that is commonly asked in you know, introductory ASL courses, for example. And then finally, they might be shown, or they are shown the sign again, which might look like this. And I'd like to point out that these videos are from Signing Savvy, which is an English to ASL dictionary online. And you know, we're pretty good at solving this problem of moving from a written language to a sign language because we're good at string matching. You can type in an English word that you're trying to look for, and we can match that fairly well against words in our, in our database. Uh, but moving the other way is a bit trickier, and that's the problem that our system is trying to address. All right, so we have this two-part system where the ASL search, search, search dictionary is sharing a signed feature database with the ASL flash site, which is providing data. Uh, but how well does our design actually work? To try to evaluate this, we deployed ASL flash with 100 signs. We had 94 users provide us with 670 queries or feature descriptions. And then we simulated the performance of the dictionary using leave one out cross validation. So we reserve one query or one set of features uh, to simulate a user trying to look up a sign. And then we train our latent semantic analysis model on the rest of the data. And then we see what kind of results our dictionary would return for that one held out uh, query. So here's a plot of the results. The x-axis shows queries per sign, which grows as the dictionary is being used. Here it's ranging from uh, zero to six queries per sign. And then our y-axis shows discounted cumulative gain, which is a standard metric used to evaluate the performance of uh, search engines. And here a value of one would mean that the desired sign is the first in the result list. A value of about 0.8 would mean that it's in the top two a value of 0.7 or so would mean it's in the top three, and so on. So you can see that the dictionary improves over time as it collects more and more data. Uh, after Once it has about six queries per sign, it's consistently returning results in the top three of the results, of the results list. Um, and we compared this against several existing methods, which typically look for a match against an expert evaluation. Uh, so this green line shows the best, best, 
the best baseline that we found, which returns signs sorted by Hamming distance. So basically looking at how many features differ between the incoming query and the expert evaluation for every sign. How big is the dictionary in this case? So this simulation was run with 100 signs. So it's a small set. And it would do worse if we had more signs. So for more details, I'll refer you to our CSCW paper. You can also visit the ASL Flash system at aslflash.org. Right now, I'm working on scaling up the corpus of signs. We're working to scale to about 12,000 signs, I believe, to cover uh, basic ASL. And I'm also playing around with some other methods for matching signs to queries to see if we can do better using other machine learning techniques. All right, so that was the ASL to English dictionary called ASL Search. And thinking back to this talk's takeaways, I'd like to point out that ASL Search uses modern technologies, namely topic modeling and crowdsourcing, to solve a longstanding access problem, specifically looking up signs. So next I'll switch gears a bit and talk about alternate English scripts that improve legibility for low vision readers. So this is a different user group we're talking about. All right, so suppose this is your personal device. It might be your smartphone. And you have very blurry vision, which is a very rough approximation of low vision. Can anyone see what this says? I don't know, maybe a few of you can, but it's pretty hard. Uh, what many people with low vision do in order to read is zoom in. Uh, but then you lose the complete text, and you're forced to pan around the screen to read the content. Reading small text is a big problem for millions of people. As I mentioned earlier, there are hundreds of millions of people who are visually impaired or have low vision. Um, and as we get older, everybody's eyes begin to lose the ability to focus, which is why you see a lot of older people wearing reading glasses. And to make this matter worse, we're moving towards a world of personal computing devices, which have small screens and limit the display, the, the, the size of the text that's displayed. So this reading experience is pretty bad, I would argue. Uh, but what if, instead of giving people special tools like Zoom, we made new letter forms, right? Why are we using these letter forms? Uh, they were developed thousands of years ago, um, and they were developed when we were forced to write by hand. But yes? No, they weren't. Well, okay, maybe not these, but <laughs> Hebrew letters. Le <laughs> scripts have been around for thousands of years. Like the the sans serif uh, typographic alphabet is pretty new. OK, that's true. But it was still developed to primarily to be written and read by hand on paper, which is why we have single colored scripts that are primarily made of uh, lines, curves, and dots. Um, anyway, their origins are in a time before computers. <laughs> I think we can all agree on that. Um, and while typography is a wonderful field, um, there is this really exciting opportunity to redesign letters for modern screens. So maybe by redesigning our letter forms, we can actually help improve legibility. So to give you some intuition for why redesigning letter forms might improve legibility, let's consider the script on the right. It consists of trad traditional letters, but each letter has a unique color and animation combination. And as the text comes out of focus, letter shape becomes imperceptible, meaning that traditional text is illegible, but the colors and the animations remain on the right. Based on this idea, we presented the idea of smart fonts, which are scripts that replace traditional letter forms with new letter forms to improve the reading experience. Uh, they're one-to-one -one mappings, replacing each traditional letter form with a new character. They preserve spelling, grammar, and punctuation, and they're conceptually similar to Braille, which was designed to be more easily read tactilely. Live fonts are a subcategory of smart fonts. They're also one-to-one -one mappings of the traditional alphabet, but they leverage animation to help differentiate letter forms even more. So when we're moving away from pen and, pa pen and paper, 
towards screens, we can actually make use of animation. To give you a feel for the design space, uh, here are some non-animated smart fonts that we've played around with. Uh, and live fonts are a subspace within this space that use animation to uh, enhance and expand the design space. And as far as we know, we're the first to propose using animation to differentiate letters in a script. So animation has been used in text displays before, in particular in movie trailers, uh, where you have uh, fancy text displays. But here, we're actually using animation to show you the meaning of the letter itself. So animating letters is not as crazy as it might seem. Uh, many platforms already support animated emoji, which appear in line with stationary text. So here's an example from Skype. And as we move away from pen and paper towards screen displays, we have this really exciting opportunity to integrate animation into text, which is already happening, and live fonts just take to the next level. All right, so we have this idea of redesigning letter forms and using animation, potentially, to differentiate them. But how to do this is not so clear. Uh, the design space becomes virtually unlimited when you're not constrained to what you can create by hand. Uh, so how can we design novel scripts to improve legibility in a principled way? To give you an idea of how we can do this, I'll talk about how we designed our live fonts. So we started the design process by talking to people with low vision and showing them different designs and getting their feedback on what worked for them. Uh, so we found ultimately that colored blocks with simple animations on a black background were the most legible in general to the people that we talked to. So this really helped us narrow our design space to just animated blocks of color. What, what was the test that you used there? What, Yeah, so we had some uh, legibility tests. We asked people to identify characters or to transcribe them, and we saw how well they did. And we also talked to people and got their feedback on what was working and what wasn't working. So after we narrowed our design space, we ran a crowdsourced perceptual study to fully explore this narrowed design space with the goal of finding a set of characters that is highly discernible. So here's a demo of our task. We have a very tiny target character at the top. And the task was to identify the color and animation. We provided 11 options for color, which were the commonly named colors in English, and uh, nine options for the animation, giving 99 possible options. And we made the target so small because we wanted to learn about discern discernibility at small sizes. So we ran this experiment on Mechanical Turk with 50 participants. Each participant saw each possible character, giving us 5,386 evaluations, with a couple of exceptions. And from this data, we're able to create a 99 by 99 confusion matrix between every possible character and every other possible character. So that basically shows how often the displayed character or the target character was transcribed as every other character. And here I'm just showing a submatrix of the 99 by 99, and the diagonal was made to be zero to highlight the variability in the rest of the data. Now with this data, we formulated our design problem as a minimization problem, where we're trying to pick the set of 26 characters that minimize the confusion within the set. We ended up using a branch and bound algorithm to find an optimal solution because this is an empty hard problem. And fortunately, the algorithm terminated quickly and gave us some results. So here are the final two optimized results. We include jumping characters in one because we wanted to see if the additional vertical space uh, paid off in terms of improved, improved legibility. OK, so now that we've got our designs, we face the question, can smart and live fonts actually improve legibility for low vision readers? Do these designs actually work? And by legibility here, again, we mean how small characters can be 
and still be legible. So evaluating the legibility of scripts that nobody knows how to read is actually a really hard problem. So traditional legibility tests typically involve asking somebody to read some text or to identify some characters. And if they don't know how to read the script and they don't know what characters are in the alphabet, that becomes those tests don't really apply. So we developed some of our own methods. Here I'll just show you one. Uh, this is a transcription task where the participant was presented with a five character string at the top and their job was to transcribe the string character by character using a visual keyboard. So here you can see the keyboard is organized by animation and color and that supports visual search and it also shows fairly easily which characters are actually in the alphabet. We started this experiment with a calibration step to tailor the size of the target to that person's vi vision because low vision can vary so much. And each subsequent target was 90% the size of the previous one. And we cut them off when they reached failure, which we defined as making a mistake on at least six out of 10 characters across two back-to-back -back trials. All right, so we compared several scripts. We compared uh, some smart fonts against our, animate, our two animated live fonts, and we also compared against two traditional looking fonts. So uh, one of those two fonts was actually a font tailored to low vision, and we basically found uh, no significant improvement in legibility when you're using even a script that's traditional looking but tailored to low vision. So if you need to zoom in this much, you're basically stuck at that size. We found that our best smart font improved legibility somewhat. It was equivalently legible at about three-fourths the area. And then we found that our live fonts pr provided even more benefit with th this version, the non-jumping one, uh, comparably legible at about half the size of Latin. And by Latin, I mean the traditional letter forms that we use. So these are average results, but there were individual participants for whom these scripts uh, were even more effective. So some low vision participants were able to make out our life font at a quarter the size of Latin, and some sighted participants were able to make out the life font at a sixth the size of Latin. And even though this was a small study, so you should keep that in mind, uh, I think these results are quite exciting. And again, this was a transcription of what the task was transcription? Yeah, it was the transcription task you saw. Yeah, do you have a graph? Yes, in the paper, yeah. Uh, all right, so our, question. yeah. So for how long were people actually looking at that? Was it 10 minutes, 30 minutes, or how long? Uh, so I, I gave them as much time as they wanted. It was an in-lab study, so I was sitting down with all of our participants. Um, it was untimed. They were also doing the same task for each different script. Uh, so it, I think it was about an hour for each participant to get through that whole, to get through that task for all of the different scripts. And then we also had a second task that, that we were asking them to do. So the whole thing took an hour. I don't know exactly for each script, maybe. So, so I'm wondering if any of the participants reported any sort of duress or stress from looking at digital Yeah, so yeah, that's a great question. There were a couple of participants who really did not like the blinking in particular. Um, it really depended on the individual participant, what type of low vision they have. Um, some people found it fun, some people hated it. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. And how, how did you decide on the frequency? I mean, you could imagine these being much more subtle uh, kind of. Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, so I played with this and I just basically used my own eye um, and I wanted to increase the number of different animations that we had. So for most of the animations, we have two different speeds for them, a quick version and a slow version. Um, but I mean, this is, this is just the first project in this space and I think there are so many questions that are worth looking into. There's so many different design options. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I, I really agree with your, your intuition that uh, there is um, 
uh, economists call this uh, path dependency, that you end up with a solution that's based on historical contingencies that may no longer apply. Gosh, we could do anything now. So I, I mean, I think the, the algorithm, the, the meta algorithm that you're using for this work is amazing. I'm, I'm a little skeptical of this particular alphabet um, because of things like, um, you know, I wonder whether, for example, the number of users who uh, are not trichromats is large enough that you wouldn't want to adopt this widely. Um, or uh, lighting variation can change color perception pretty enormously. Um, and that shifts over, over our lifetime. Um, you know, the, the human perceptual system is, is really built to notice moving things, which would make reading any length of text that, that was interactive tough. Yeah, I think those are all great points. And the, exploring the design space further is a huge area for future work. Um, I guess the kind of the point that we were going for here is that redesigning letter forms can have value. And whereas when we're sticking to traditional looking letter forms, maybe we can improve legibility a few percent. But when we completely go for something new, uh, there's much more opportunity. Um, so we're not claiming that this is the optimal design by any means. Um, but this is yeah. something that's worth thinking about, at least, and, I think. I mean, the other one is that it, depend, I think it'll, it will depend not immaterially on what you use as your comparison typeface. You know, like the, the small optical counters in the, the left-hand side that you see here are going to make blurry vision tough. Um, you know, often, in fact, like the Microsoft typographers these days are doing some really beautiful stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, so for example, you know, in this one, uh, it, you can decrease leading and increase X height and do a couple other things to, to actually get some pretty significant legibility wins. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. And actually, Kevin Larson uh, from Microsoft is one of my collaborators on this. So, yeah. And I, I'd also like to point out in relation to that that. Uh, because we have personal devices, we don't all have to adopt the same script, right? And we don't even all have to adopt this. If I like it, I can use it. If you, you know, don't like it, you can stick to traditional letters. If someone else is colorblind, they can pick a version that doesn't leverage color. Um, so it's there, are, there are reasons why uh, it's appealing to have scripts that are widely used. I, I agree with you that, that it doesn't need to be n equals one. But, but covering a big chunk of the gamut is pretty valuable. Sure. It also seems like another dimension is learnability. You know, yes. not, you know, investing <laughs> enough time to. Yes, which brings us to the next part of the talk. Um, so we asked this question, OK, great. We have some designs. It seems like they can help some people. But that's useless if people can't actually read them and they can't learn to read them. Um, so to evaluate this, we developed a website to teach people how to read a smart or life font. The main feature was a set of yes, no questions, which were crowdsourced questions from MindPixel. And they're typically fun in nature. So this one reads, do horses have wings, yes or no? The site also provided a tutorial on the script, flashcards to help you practice, and a cheat sheet in case you got stuck. We also provided overlays for some of our scripts, so you can see that these characters are overlaid with traditional letter forms. And that was used as a kind of crutch. Over time, we removed the overlays, and they were just using the new system. So here you can see the letter A in have does not have an overlay, and the rest of the letters do. So here are some results after our participants completed 2,000 practice questions, which took them about two to three hours a day for about a week. So it's not a huge investment. And this shows participants' average reading speed relative to their reading speed with traditional letters, which again are called Latin. Um, and we were able to do this comparison because every 10th question was uh, unencoded. So a value of 1 here means that they're reading at the same speed as, tradi as with traditional letter forms. Value of 2 means that they're twice as slow, and so on. So you can see for our stationary smart fonts, on average, people were about two to seven times slower after a week of practicing. With our live font, uh, people were about three to four times as slow after a week of practicing. And 
I find this result particularly, particularly exciting because this suggests that animated scripts are comparably learnable to stationary ones. And this is the first time that anyone's actually studied the learnability of uh, animated scripts. So um, it's, a, it's a first result in this space, and I think it's I've kind got, of cool. I'm confused. Are you saying that more practice makes you slower? No. So, so these are the results. So we had different participants learning different scripts. So each bar represents a group of participants that were learning that particular script. And the number shows how many times slower they were at reading the, encoded, the, the new script compared to their speed with traditional letter forms. So we normalized everybody's speed because everyone has different reading rates. Um, does that answer your question? So those three boxes on the lower left are three different systems. Yeah, yeah. So some people were, lear were learning the <coughs> blocky characters that are black, uh, red, and blue. Some people were learning that second script. Some people were learning the colored blocks. And some people were learning a live font. And we did not evaluate the stationary scripts with low vision users, but we did um, on the live fonts. So I'd also like to note that these are average results. Uh, so it might sound kind of bad, oh, I'm twice as slow, I'm five times as slow, I'm seven times as slow, I'm never going to use this system. Um, but uh, there were individual participants within each group, so participants learning at each of these scripts, who actually reached or exceeded their uh, Latin reading rate, which is kind Wait, of cool. What, what's your y-axis? The y-axis is how many times slower they were at reading encoded questions compared to unencoded questions. So if I take 10 seconds to answer an encoded question on average, and I take five seconds to answer you know, an unencoded one, then my score is two. OK. All right, so for more details on this, I'll point you to our WIST papers in 2016 and 2017. And right now, I'm thinking about ways to integrate smart fonts more easily into computers and personal devices, and uh, exploring other designs and running a longitudinal reading study. So this was just a week of people practicing, but what happens if they use it for months or years, and what happens if they're reading long passages of text? All right, so those were our alternate English scripts. And again, I'd like to point out that personal devices are really what makes this possible. You know, it's possible for individuals to adopt new scripts without mass adoption and without language reform for the first time in history, really, because we have personal devices. Before, we were all sharing a printing press or some other way of publishing, um, which we still do, but uh, personal devices make uh, individual adoption much more possible. Yeah, so. You know, some work where they actually fuzz the, the text to be able to easy, more easily recognize words in the shape of things. Yeah. So you know, all the stuff you could do at another level, too. Yeah, we thought a lot about that. Um, it's similar to how in Braille, Braille 2 and 3, we, you have strings that are rep represented by single characters or words. Uh, we thought about doing that. Uh, but as a first project, we decided to stick to this. We also had one script where letters actually get compressed so that they're occupying the same uh, horizontal space. So we had some characters occupy the top part of, of the row, some occupy the middle, and some occupy the bottom. And that allows for kind of extreme kerning. So we were able to kind of layer characters on top of each other. And then words become kind of uh, like a logogram where it's you know, one symbol almost for the whole word. Uh, so we did play around with that a bit. All right, so I'll switch gears a little bit now and talk about the last project, which is an animated ASL character system. So it's similar to Smart and Live Fonts in that it is a character system, meaning it's a system for reading and writing, but it is for the ASL, the American Sign Language community. All right, so as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, much of our communications are text-based, and this can be problematic for ASL users who don't have a widely accepted written form 
of their language. And you might be wondering why ASL users or deaf people in the US can't just use English for reading and writing. And here are a few reasons why. So first of all, ASL is its own language. It's not signed English. It has its own grammar, its own vocabulary. And if you know English, you don't necessarily know ASL and vice versa. Related to that, there's no universal sign language. So American Sign Language is different from Greek Sign Language, which is different from uh, any other type of sign language. Uh, many people are deaf from birth, so hearing loss is not just something that comes with old age. Once you've already learned English, there are a lot of people who grow up deaf, and it can be really difficult to learn a written language without hearing it. Not that nobody learns it, there are excellent readers, but it can be really difficult. Uh, related to that, deaf literacy rates are low. Uh, so uh, the majority of deaf high school graduates in the US have about a fourth grade English reading level, and that's another barrier to just using English. Uh, ASL is also the primary language of the United States and Canada deaf community. Uh, so there's a whole culture and community surrounding this language, so facilitating communication in it is really important. And finally, automatic translation between ASL and English and vice versa is unsolved. Uh, computer vision can't do this yet. And part of the reason why is that we don't have these large written corpuses that we have for uh, written and spoken languages to learn from. All right, so some ASL character systems have been proposed, but in general, they're difficult to learn and they don't really resemble live signing. So there are a class of linguistic notation systems primarily used by linguists to document and study the language. This is an example of Stokey notation, one of the most famous. There are also notation systems designed primarily for computers to model sign language in. And again, these are typically difficult to learn and use because they're primarily made for computers. Now there's a final class of writing systems that are made for reading and writing and everyday use. Uh, these are somewhat easier to learn, but I'd argue that they're still pretty difficult because you have to learn how to represent 3D mov movements on a 2D piece of paper. And here are two examples, sign writing uh, in the top and SI56, SI5S on the bottom. All right. So unlike notation systems, videos do not need to be studied and they do resemble live signing. So they're immediately understandable because they look like live signing. Um, however, video does not provide the same functionality as text. You know, for example, text presents ideas in the abstract and it gives you dynamic control over your reading speed and provides visual context so you're not viewing just one frame at a time. So even though videos can't fully replace text, you know, can we leverage some of the power of dynamic displays to improve reading and writing systems for ASL? Um, as I mentioned before, writing systems have traditionally been constrained to what is easily handwritten, but when we move to using text on screens, we can actually integrate animation into the text. So can this help us to design an ASL character system that's easier to learn and more closely resembles ASL? We decided to try this out and created a system called ASL Live, which is the first animated ASL character system. And it uses animation to represent sign movements rather than drawn symbols. So you don't need to memorize the meaning of these symbols anymore. Although you do need to memorize this, the meaning of other symbols. So here's an example of a full sentence. So this is, you go to school tomorrow. And this is what the animated version would look like. You can see we removed the symbols representing movement and replaced them with actual animations on the screen. And this system, we did not build from scratch. It's based on the SI5S writing system that I showed you earlier, uh, which is a really great system. Um, and uh, so, but to use our animated version, you don't actually have to memorize all how to represent 3D in 2D. 
All right, so before we get too far, uh, let's check in with the ASL community to see what they think of animated characters. And it's important to involve the community because this is their language, right? So we asked the question, do ASL users think an animated character system is a good idea? Uh, to, to, oh. Okay. Uh, so to help answer this question, we ran an online survey and we asked people, do you think that animating ASL characters can be valuable? 71% uh, answered yes, 22% said I'm not sure, and 7% said no. Um, so in this survey, we asked them about their ASL usage, uh, how they communicate over text, and we also showed them some animated characters to explain the idea. So the majority of people answered yes, which is promising. We also probed into their ASL usage more, asking what material would you like to read in ASL? And the thing I'd like to point out here is that under 20% of participants answered nothing, meaning that over 80% of our participants did want to read some material in ASL. So there is a need on some level for a written system. Given that people want to read in ASL, we asked them, what has prevented you from using ASL character systems more? And I'd like to point out that the number one reason that people reported is that they're hard to learn. And, and this is actually something that ASL Flash is, or sorry, ASL Live is designed to help with by representing sign movements through movements on the screen rather than through complicated symbols that need to be memorized. All right, so, but are we actually successful? Is there evidence that animating characters can help? Uh, can animation make characters understandable without training or with minimal training? To help answer this, in the same survey, we asked people to identify signs based on just the notation alone without any training. So here's an example of a stationary sign at the top, and then they have five possible answer choices, and their job is to pick which one the notation at the top represents. And we showed participants each sign notation in the unanimated form and the animated form so that we could compare. And here's a chart of the results. Uh, so on, we evaluated the identifiability of four signs where understand, maybe, and motivation and they were chosen to represent different types of movements. On the y-axis, we have identification accuracy, or the percent of participants who correctly identified that sign from that notation type. And you can see that for three out of the four signs, animation seems to have improved identifiability. For example, for the sign where, we moved from 20% accuracy, which basically means random guessing, since you know, one out of five is 20%, um, to about 60% of participants correctly identifying the animated version. The one sign where this didn't seem to work so well was for motivation, and my hypothesis is that the way that I designed the animation wasn't really true to the sign. So in particular, the speed of the movement was much too slow and actually resembled the speed of some of the other answer choices. And I'd also like to point out that we didn't just randomly give them answer choices to pick from. We chose the answer choices to resemble the sign in question. And we actually used the dictionary that I talked about at the beginning to find close matches. All right, so it seems that animating things can help, but maybe only if they're designed appropriately. Which brings us to the question, how can we design animated ASL characters with the ASL community. To do this, we ran a participatory design workshop. And I should also mention that all this work, this last project is still ongoing and it's not published yet, so still working through some of the details here. Uh, but anyway, we ran this participatory design workshop at Gallaudet, which is the famous Deaf University in DC with 15 students there. And figuring out how to design the workshop was not trivial. Uh, we needed to organize the design decisions in some way. 
So we, can't, we came up with a set of decisions that we needed to make in order to create these animations. We needed to figure out how to represent 3D movements in 2D line-drawn characters. We also needed to make decisions about the speed of the animations. We needed to, to show how repeated movements were going to be represented, how we were going to show when the sign is actually starting. And some, we also needed to make decisions about how people were going to navigate through text. So I'll give you a preview of just a couple of these design decisions. So first, on the display mode, one option we gave people was to view a full page animated at once. Um, and we realized that this could be overwhelming to some people, so we gave them some other options. Uh, in this mode, only a single sign is animated at once, but you can use the left and right arrows to progress through the text. We gave them another option where the animations were available only on demand, so you'd hover over a particular sign with your mouse to see the animation. And a final display mode we provided was a single sign view. So you only see a single sign at once, and you can use left and right to scroll through the text. So it turned out that a bit over 50% of participants preferred the single sign view. Uh, though some participants preferred other modes, so giving people an option seems like a reasonable thing to do. We, as we also gave people options on how to display 3D mo movements. So here were the options we gave them for left-right movement. I don't know if, if anyone can guess which of these three options most people uh, preferred. You can hold up a finger, one, two, or three. Oh. Well, so there's, there should be two blue animated characters. One is a left-right translation, and one is translation along the diagonal with increasing size. Uh, but in any case, most people preferred just a simple left-right translation for movement up and down. Again, most people preferred a simple translation up and down on the page. And for the z-axis, which is in and out, uh, most people preferred a translation in size to indicate that something was moving in and out of the page. So we also asked participants to draw animations for a set of designs, or for a set of signs, sorry. And they did this in pairs as an instance of practicing the system. The purpose was to see if people could create animations on their own, uh, which they did do successfully, and to see if their drawings aligned with their preferences on the design decisions, which in general they did, though there were some discrepancies. And finally, I have a few quotes from participants. So one said, ASL characters are much more easier to follow if they are animated and more fun. So there is kind of a fun, cool component. It's much closer to the actual signs. Uh, deaf through written communication to deaf, i.e. IM, text, Facebook message, whatever form is not able to be video access. And there I think they're talking about one deaf person communicating with another deaf person using ASL on a platform that only supports text. And finally, these can broaden note-taking and educational materials. All right, so that was the animated ASL character system, which is, again, ongoing unpublished work. And again, this type of system is only possible with the advent of modern screens, which support animation. And it also doesn't need to be adopted by everyone. It can be an opt-in system. All right, and that brings me back to my three initial takeaways. So modern technologies support new interactions that can address longstanding accessibility challenges. This can require breaking with tradition, which personal devices allow. And finally, these systems can be designed in principled ways using data. And I'd like to give a huge thank you to my collaborators. So my wonderful advisor, Richard Ladner, at the University of Washington. Um, for exposing me to a lot of this work and supporting me throughout my PhD. Uh, Kyle Rector and Raja Kushalnagar, who've collaborated on some of the ASL-related work. And then to Adam Kalai, Sherry Azenkot, Kevin Larson, and Ann Bestmans. And in particular, Adam Kalai, who was my mentor for two summers at Microsoft Research uh, and closely collaborated with me on a lot of the smart fonts work. All right, so thank you. And any questions? <laughs> <laughs>